Um, firstly, I'd like to welcome the Consulate General, Daniel Groman, and his staff here this evening, and all those members of the Polish community. <coughs> We're very pleased to have you here this evening. The context for tonight's talk, presentation, is that uh, courtesy of the Consulate General, both uh, in, in Sydney, both um, Colin and myself uh, went on a study tour to Poland. It was an absolutely fabulous experience, um, of which Colin is going to divulge all tonight. Um, you've been listening tonight to some Chopin and then to another modern, uh, a bit more contemporary Polish composer called Henrik Gorecki. And that particular symphony is to be Polish. Gorecki, thank you. <laughs> so, so we're going to rely on the Polish in the audience tonight to correct our pronunciation. <laughs> so he's a, he's a, those, in the, those obviously in the audience are familiar with him, but that particular symphony is symphony number no. three, and uh, it was based upon the writings of a mother and child that were found in a Gestapo uh, death camp, and <coughs> so it, I think it's very poignant for, for some of the images you'll see tonight and, and also some of what Colin's going to address. Uh, so without any further ado, I'll hand you over to Colin, who is the president of the Institute, and he'll um, talk you through the meetings and the experience that we had in Poland, which, as I said, was uh, absolutely fascinating. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, thanks very much for coming. Um, I just think I should say in the beginning, the context in which we met people was that we wanted to um, find out about Poland in the 21st century. Poland is a very significant country in Europe. Um, I don't have to tell the Poles amongst the audience here, and there's a substantial number of them uh, about that. And I have to apologize to uh, our Polish guests tonight if um, I go over a bit of history, because history is really important. And um, obviously I'm not going to spend the entire evening talking about Polish history, but you can't talk about Poland in the 21st century without making some reference to the past of Poland. So my first five minutes or so is going to be spent on that. And then I'll move on to um, the kind of things that we talked about when we were in Poland. Now, who did we meet? Well, a really interesting cross um, selection of decision makers and opinion formers in Warsaw and Krakow. Uh, there were MPs, members of the Polish Parliament and the European Union. There were public servants in ministries like foreign affairs, defense, economics, and senior people in the prime minister's office. We didn't actually meet any ministers, um, but that, I don't think um, uh, we lost anything as a result of that. It would have been nice to have met the foreign minister because, as you know, he is a fantastic character and is renowned for some very memorable speeches, uh, some of which he's made in the last six months, um, particularly in relationship to the Russians and the Germans. Um, so what you're going to get is a distilled version, because most of these people were talking to us under Chatham House rules. And there were journalists as well. Um, but the journalists, um, obviously, were observers. They, they were from serious newspapers, weeklies, and newspapers like the Warsaw Business Journal. Um, so we got an interesting insight. Now, we were only there 10 days. So um, you guys that um, uh, know Poland much better than me will find errors, I'm sure, what I'm going to say, and will question me after the meeting, and questions will be welcome. But uh, I just want to give you what our impressions are. So. We're going to start off um, with a bit of history. We could move on. And we're talking about Poland's prospects here. Now, um, to understand Poland, um, according to my friend um, George Friedman, who has been in this room um, talking to our institute and is uh, author of the next 100 years, in which he um, says Poland is going to re-emerge as a major power in the future. But he says, to understand Poland, you must understand Chopin. First, listen to his Polonaise, and that's what we were playing as you came to this meeting tonight, and uh, L'Etude, and um, 
They're about hope, uh, rage, and despair. Well, Chopin is, you know, left Poland uh, in the 1830, the year the Russians crushed the Warsaw Uprising, one of several Warsaw Uprisings, but uh, a fairly significant one, and he was never to return. But he is acclaimed, and we found that in Warsaw, we went to the Chopin Museum and to a concert there. He's acclaimed because he captures his country's tragic history um, before worse was to come. Now, Andy Grove, who uh, uh, was somebody I used to know quite well in a previous life, uh, and founded the wonderful company Intel, used to say you have to be paranoid to, be, to survive. And um, I don't mean this as any kind of insult to Poles, not at all. I think it's a very wise piece of advice. Um, but it occurred, this, this quote came back to me when we were having our meetings in Warsaw. That a lot of senior Polish um, government officials, um, I wouldn't say they were paranoid, but they're anxious, nervous. They're looking over their shoulder uh, at what's going on in Europe uh, and Eurasia at the moment. So um, uh, Poland is remembering its past, I think, um, but planning for the future. Now, um, history is in Poland's soul. And again, I apologize to Poles in the audience because you know your history much better than I do, and I can't possibly encompass it all in just a few moments this evening. But um, in, 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 the, in the 17th century, Poland actually stretched from the Baltic right down almost to the, um, to the Black Sea and took over much of what is current uh, Europe. It was a huge, powerful country. But in 1795, it didn't exist. It had been broken up uh, by the Prussians, and the Russians, and the Germans. Uh, and that was only one of um, times when Poland ceased to exist. But what is interesting about the history, and I say this for our Australian friends who perhaps don't know much about Poland, is that during this period, the, Poland, the Polish people maintained their language, they maintained their spirit <coughs> uh, and their humanity. And this is one of the things that runs through the whole of Polish history. Then we had the first Polish Republic. After the Treaty of Versailles in 1919, at the end of World War I, Poland uh, really exist, uh, existed as an important and significant republic in Europe. It reclaimed as you'll see from the next slide now, lands that had lost from Russia, from Lithuania, from Germany, and from Austria. And this is Poland as it is today. Um, and you can look and you can see um, the, the boundaries. And you can see that on the left is Germany, the old enemy, but now a great friend of Poland, important investor. And on the right is Ukraine and Belarus. Belarus, which is really now in the Russian camp, I would say. Pretty much so. That's what the Poles think, anyway. And Ukraine, which faces elections in a couple of weeks, I think, uh, where um, it's anybody's guess as to where Ukraine is going. Um, Ukraine has applied for membership of the European Union, but it seems unlikely that that's going to happen. So that's Poland today. And this <coughs> slide here illustrates Poland's problem through the centuries, the great European plain. Flat lands right across northern Europe, with Poland in the middle, a country with borders that it's really difficult to defend um, without the help of outsiders. So if um, as happened in World War II, the Germans decide to invade. Resistance is there, but it won't last for long and didn't. And the same with Russia on the other side. There's some mountains to the south, 
Um, but uh, Poland is, uh, it has been over the last centuries exposed and still remains exposed. So we come now to um, that fatal day, September the 3rd, 1939. This headline is from the New York Times. When the Germans... I am speaking to you from the cabinet room at 10 Downing Street. This morning, the British ambassador in Berlin handed the German government a final note stating that unless we heard from them by 11 o'clock, that they were prepared at once to withdraw their troops from Poland, a state of war would exist between us. I have to tell you now that no such undertaking had been received, and that consequently this country is at war with Germany. Well, as you know, that was the start of World War II. Um, a terrible war, um, which um, obviously many people in this room are old enough to remember, including me. Um, and that was Neville Chamberlain, who only a few weeks uh, before that declaration of war had visited Adolf Hitler and had said, returning to London, there will be peace in our time. It wasn't to be, of course, and we know what happened after that. So, um, if you want to read more about this, and there's many books, of course, you can read, and I can't spend the whole evening talking about history, particularly wartime history, but I do recommend a book by um, Timothy Snyder called Bloodlands, Europe Between Hitler and Stalin. And the point he makes, as you can read in this quote uh, now, which is on the screen there, is that um, in the 12 years between 1933 and 1945, 14 million people were murdered. But these weren't the victims of war, even though halfway through um, this period, Poland was the battleground. These were the victims of murderous policies of Joseph Stalin and Adolf Hitler, who were working together. And it's this, I think, that um, gives Poland long memories. So on Saturday, bright sunny Saturday morning, what was it, three weeks ago, this is where we were, Auschwitz the worst of the German extermination camps, Nazis' extermination camps in Poland. It was built, effectively, um, to deal with Poles, not with Jews. Um, ultimately, of course, it was the final solution for Jews from right across Europe. But in the first years after the camp was built, it was Poles, Pol Polish political prisoners, people who were rounded up and were opponents of the Nazis who were taken here and basically either put to slave labor and then they died or they were gassed. Now, if you look at this picture, you, you might think, well, that looks like um, a boys' boarding school in Britain, you know, um, pretty fairly Spartan. It was built by the Germans, um, purpose-built. But actually, you, when you look in more detail, this courtyard, if you look at the back, you'll see a wall. And it was this wall where people who um, were used as examples to frighten uh, the inmates, uh, who were terminal anyway, they were going to die, but um, they were shot, executed right on the spot, while people were attempting to um, sleep in or live in the rooms adjoining here. And this is the railway line. And the thing about um, Auschwitz now, and why it's such an interesting place to go to, is that it's been preserved more or less as it was. 
It's, um, it's a museum, of course, but there's been very little attempt to change it from how it existed in, in 1940, 1943. And um, you can see the railway line, the trucks bring people from all over Europe arrived here. People were shepherded out and moved on to that road to the left. And uh, the ones that looked fit and decent were sent off to do labor. Uh, but they were more or less starved, and so they could only labor for a certain amount of time. And then they either died or were so weak that they weren't any use anymore. So they were um, sent to extermination. Or more likely, most of the people were sent to the right, up to the top of the picture, to the gas chambers, within half an hour or so of their arrival. And children, lots of children, were taken away for the most appalling medical experiments. Mm -hmm. And then when these experiments had been um, completed, they were also taken to the gas chambers. <coughs> now this is one of the gas chambers. Um, Louisa and I went inside this particular chamber. The chambers are still there as they were, uh, together with the um, cremation bays. Um, roughly 2,000 people were exterminated in 20 minutes. Lined up, led in there, stripped off. They believed they were going there to have a shower, some of them anyway. And then um, the Nazis released the gas pellets inside the chamber, and within 20 minutes they were dead. It took much longer to cremate them. This is um, a record, a relic of the gas canisters that we found here. And this, uh, these are the children's shoes, and some of the shoes of the others who perished in Auschwitz. I think it's fair to say that uh, at this point, um, Louise had had enough and um, had to leave. It was a really shocking thing to, s to see all of this. However, that's history. And um, that's all I'm going to say about history. There's much more, because I really want to talk about Poland today. But you'll understand in a minute why you can't really talk about Poland today without understanding the past. And although this past is 70 years on, there's enough going on in the world today to worry Poland about what faces it in the future, in my opinion. So um, that was the Prime Minister's office you saw. This is modern Warsaw. Warsaw is a really interesting and wonderful city. Um, somebody said to me they thought it we would find it rather drab. I didn't find it so. I was amazed by the parks and open spaces, the wonderful buildings, I have to say, the fantastic restaurants in Warsaw. We were given great hospitality. And we went to literally um, five or six meetings every day. So by the end of it, we were exhausted. But um, we saw a fair bit of, of, um, of this capital city. This is the parliament building. That's the entrance to parliament. And on the right is um, where MPs uh, can stay when they are in Warsaw. I have to say the parliament in Warsaw sits for a good many more days than they do up in Canberra. Um, it's not quite full time, but almost. And uh, a lot of business is conducted there through two houses. The lower house, of course, is the most active one. So, um, coming now to Warsaw in the present, I think it's all about security. Security of the country and its borders, which is a preoccupation, of pretty well everyone you speak to in the government and uh, who watches government or is involved in politics. Security of the economy, also highly important. And security of energy supplies, which uh, is something which is often forgotten and not much talked about, um, but is really important in Poland. And you'll see why in a minute. Now, the two institutions which um, Poland has relied on, or does rely on now, for its security, 
for its future, really, and has done so for many years now, since uh, the end of the Berlin War, and NATO and the European Union. Both of these are absolutely key. Poland is an enthusiastic member of both. And wherever we went, I think that it's fair to say, in the foreign ministry, in the defense ministry, particularly in the defense ministry, and amongst journalists we met also, and commentators, everyone calls out the five of the NATO treaty. Now, I'm not going to read all of this, because otherwise, you know, we'll go on for too long. But what it says, basically, is what we know about ANSYS in Australia. It basically is the same concept. That if any one member is attacked by anybody else, uh, then other members will go um, to their aid sub through arms, subject to the agreement of the United Nations. And you can read this um, text, and that is, that is what Poland security rests on, Article 5 of the United Nations Treaty. NATO Treaty. NATO. NATO Treaty, I beg your pardon. Yes, thank you. NATO Treaty. That, that is critical. But the question that we found debated in Warsaw, uh, which was raised by almost everyone we met, not always in the negative, I have to say, but nonetheless was raised, is are NATO and the European Union reliable institutions. And I think the, there will be people who say yes they are, and there are people who say no they're not, but there's enough people in Poland who are really worried about both institutions. And uh, feel it's very important that their future within these institutions is more securely settled than it is at the moment. So um, the trigger for this debate was um, was the cancellation by President Barack Obama of the anti-ballistic missile system, um, which was to be based in Poland and parts of Czechoslovakia. Um, that was seen by Poles as critical to their security, not so much because of the system itself, because the Americans uh, said, when the Russians complained about it, that the system wasn't there to uh, defend uh, Europe or America against attack from Russia, but from Iran. Uh, and that was the line which was spun very firmly by the White House and by the Pentagon uh, for some time. Now, I'm not uh, an expert enough to know whether that's true or not, um, but the Poles wanted Americans on their soil, manning the system. And when Barack Obama <coughs> announced, with very little warning, actually the Polish government was not consulted beforehand, as I understand it, they made that clear to us, and also on a rather sensitive day in the Polish historical can can uh, calendar, it was a big shock. And that's what uh, triggered, really, this debate about um, defense of Poland. That's the, that's the system. It was designed to uh, intercept attacks on the West uh, and basically blow them out of the sky. Um, the Russians pushed back uh, and said, this must not happen, and actually rearranged their own defense system to have rockets trained on Warsaw, which of course didn't um, help the paranoia in, in Poland's capital city. And um, there were many speeches and many statements made by Polish leaders at the time about this. And um, the real reason for it is because of not because of a, an upsurge in Russia under Vladimir Putin. Um, that's really, I found, to be Poland's main concern at the moment. 
and a worst case scenario. And we are talking about a worst case scenario because the Poles are talking to the Russians and at some levels they have very good relations with the Russians, but at other levels they don't. But on the worst case scenario, Russia is a threat. And it becomes an even greater threat if the European Union uh, disintegrates. And who knows what's going to happen to the European Union? We really don't know. Um, the story changes day by day. But this is the concern I found in Poland. So, Poland now hopes for a new ballistic missile system um, produced by NATO. And there are talks about it, and there are premise promises about it, and um, there are plans for this to happen. But they are plans and they are talks. There is nothing of sub substance that anyone can really say can be relied upon. In the meantime, Poland's Prime Minister has announced that Poland will have its own defense system. Now, this, this uh, has been to some extent overplayed by the media because Poland can't afford the kind of system which was to have been put in place by the United States. What this is, is a replacement for a rather aging system on Poland's borders. Um, but nevertheless, <coughs> it is continuing. And um, the former ambassador of Poland to Jerusalem, to, to Israel, um, has now become the national security advisor to the prime minister. And while she was in Israel, she um, gained a great deal of knowledge of um, Israel's defense systems. And um, indeed, uh, Poland has a long-term relationship with Israel. So although there are other players in this who may well appear on the scene, including Americans, but um, it's highly likely that um, the Poles will have a limited defense system based on, um, based on Israeli technology. A new concept paper on this system is going to be published before the end of this year, we're told. And the new defense white paper will come out at the end of the year, we're told. I'm slightly suspicious of the second because I find it rather surprising that a white paper would be published within, say, one month of a United States election. And although we probably think um, President Obama is going to um, win the election. Nothing is certain in politics, and I would have thought um, they would wait until after the election before moving to uh, publish anything substantial. Well, that's just my opinion. Now, the other conversation going on in Poland is, um, is European common security. Uh, you may remember that the Secretary General of the, Russian, of the European Parliament came here and told us that he thought that the Europeans should get together and organize their own security. Well, um, there are moves to do that. Uh, but I have to say that wherever we tested this out, the idea, yes, the Poles are going to meetings in Brussels and Paris and, and Berlin and everywhere else, but they don't really believe in it. And um, the Poles are sad that the British are not, have not got their hearts in the European Union at the moment. And uh, they don't really think that this um, European security system is getting anywhere. There was the formation of a 2,000 strong European Rapid Reaction Force. But as somebody um, said, that's not going to get to Warsaw in time. Um, just as the British and the French didn't get to Warsaw after Hitler invaded in 1939. Um, nobody really believes in that. And um, there were some pretty adverse comments about the high representative of the European Union, a Brit called Catherine Ashton, who is in charge of this project at the moment. So, I think we can dismiss this as something that's really not going to happen, certainly not in the foreseeable future, and certainly not until Europe sorts out its other problems. So, 
has moved to the Polish economy. Now, the Poles have benefited from um, joining the European Union in 2004. It's been an absolute godsend to Poland. One in 20 Europeans is actually a Pole. So Poland is a significant country in Europe and its voice does count. Uh, it also has become, particularly in economic matters, very close to the Germans. And the German-Polish um, um, economic group is particularly strong. And as Europe debates what's going to happen with Greece and Portugal and Spain and Italy and all of that, uh, the Poles are more and more inclined to form a group called the Hanseatic Group of European countries, which would include Germany, but it would also include other North European countries that are in the Union. Uh, in order to actually carry more clout, they support the German austerity program by and large. Not totally, but by and large. Um, Poland, um, um, Poland has been one of Europe's success stories, actually, in recent years. It's achieved this through um, economic reforms, through privatization, and heavy foreign investment, particularly from Germany, but also from the United States. And it's a diverse, flexible economy, with its own currency, it stayed out of the Eurozone. And several people we met actually thought Poland should have joined the Eurozone. But I think the majority opinion was that it was wise to stay out, <coughs> wise to depend on the lotty, to have a flexible exchange rate and make Poland quite competitive, as indeed it has been. And uh, it was one of the few European countries that managed to survive the global financial crisis of two or three years ago without running into recession. But there are bumps ahead. And one of them is that um, the economy is slowing down this year. Um, competitiveness, competitiveness is weakening. And growth is much weaker than the OECD forecast that it would be. Um, Poland, like Australia, and there are many similarities with Australia, is fighting to um, uh, reduce um, budget deficits and get within the European zone um, supposed 3% of GDP figure. And uh, <coughs> unemployment is also high and rising. 10%. <coughs> this is uh, a severe problem, and it's a particularly severe problem amongst young people, particularly educated young people who go to university. We met several of them, including one of our guides, who said, well, you know, you go to university, you get a degree, then really it's very, very hard to uh, find a job unless you leave the country, which is rather sad. Uh, on the other hand, Nomura, the Japanese uh, bank, their chief economist for Poland told us that um, Poland is the closest you get to a Goldilocks economy in Europe. Well, of course we know what some of the other economies are like, and particularly those of France and Britain and Greece and so on. Um, as I said earlier, Poland is inextricably linked to Germany. But there are issues with Germany. It would like a free energy market and a free electricity market, and you'll see why in a moment. Just a bit about <coughs> the Polish economy. Our Polish friends here will know this, so apologies to them for telling them something they already know. Um, but um, Australians here won't. Um, nine out of ten products um, made in Poland end up in the living rooms of people. Not just the living rooms of Poles, but the living rooms of people right across Europe. And um, they include things like furniture and furnishings <coughs> and uh, white goods. Poland is, I think, Europe's biggest producer of refrigerators through American investment there. Um, furniture is the world's fourth largest exporter 
of um, furniture with 6,000 companies in furniture manufacture, um, with the, wood, the timber coming from the extensive um, Polish woodlands. Jewelry, um, obviously amber is a speciality. My colleague managed to come back with a fair amount of amber. Um, she was absolutely fascinated by the amber, the shops, the jewelry shops that sold this. And um, I have to say, it was very impressive. Cosmetics was a big industry there, as is pharmaceuticals. Exports in the pharmaceutical sector up 30% a year. And um, Poland makes a lot of boats. Uh, one of the biggest boat builders, 22,000 vessels annually are built there. Medical equipment using new technology is another feature of Poland and all kinds of health products. And of course agricultural products because Poland still is a major agricultural country in Europe and that's one of the benefits is gained from Brussels. But energy security and this is the third of my security headlines, is a really big problem. And some people told me this is the biggest problem in Poland, even beyond defense. Um, Poland uh, is dependent, it's got a lot of coal, of course, but coal is out of fashion, just as it is here. And the European Union would like Poland to stop producing so much coal because of the impact it has on greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, and the European targets in that area. Um, so um, it's looking for more gas, and it's building a new gas terminal on the Baltic, bringing gas from places as far as Gatar in the Persian Gulf and elsewhere. Um, it's also um, nuclear power features. There's plans to build a new nuclear power station um, up on the Baltic, but the big issue is shale gas. We've heard that before in Australia, because we had a session on gas here just a few weeks ago, which unfortunately I missed. Now, um, these show where Poland's shale gas reserves are. And actually, this is a Polish map, and it spills over to Ukraine next door as well. And this is a very complicated, but absolutely fascinating story because um, Poland needs to start developing this gas. Um, because Russia's gas prom, and Russia of course has an enormous reserves of gas, is overcharging Poland. It's charging Poland pretty well more than almost anyone else for Russian gas. Uh, so the Poles are being held to ransom by Mr. Putin and his friends. Um, Poland also has the largest reserves, it believes, of shale gas in the whole of Europe. And um, it doesn't exactly know how much the reserves are. That's the issue. Because uh, exploration is going on apace at the moment. But um, when you ask for figures, the figures you get are very rubbery and sometimes rather old and out of date. So no one has really got a good figure on how much the total reserves of shale gas are. But early results, I was told by um, Mr. Shale in the foreign ministry, there's somebody in the foreign ministry who uh, was a wonderful informant on uh, shale gas, uh, says they're frankly not up to expectations. Exxon Mobil, one of the world's biggest um, oil and gas producers, has pulled out of Poland completely. It's just left. It hasn't actually handed over its um, licenses yet, but it's gone. But where's it gone? It's done a deal with Rosneft. Rosneft is the Russian state developer of oil and gas, and it is the major partner of Rosneft in exploiting and exploring the Arctic. Now, the Poles believe that when the executives of uh, ExxonMobil decided to go 
off, off with Rosneft that um, the Kremlin imposed a condition that they pull out of Poland's shale gas. Now, um, various people think that's a conspiracy theory. Um, conspiracy theories are very uh, alive in Warsaw. You hear a lot of them. It may or may not be true. I don't know. Interestingly, at the same time as Exxon Mobil have gone, Chevron, another big oil major, has come in <coughs> and made Warsaw the center of its East European shale gas development arm, including um, countries such as Romania and Ukraine. But the mystery deepens. And here I've headed this potential and real uh, Warsaw conspiracy theories, <laughs> because there are many. There's the Russians, there's the Germans, there's the French, and there's the Greens, and there's the European Union. Now, it is worth spending a minute on this, I think, because it's absolutely fascinating. The Russians don't really want Poland to develop its shale gas, because it's a competitor, and it would um, impact the prices that Russia is able to gain right across Europe. Parallel with this, the European Union last fortnight announced an investigation into gas and Gazprom's price fixing, uh, trying to complaining that they were sort of running a monopoly. And uh, in fact, Putin blocked this by a decree, he issued a decree which said that Gazprom is not allowed to provide any information to anyone in the European Union about what it's doing. So that's sort of stifling this investigation. Uh, so there's reasonable evidence that um, the Russians are trying to block um, Poland's uh, development of shale gas. There's a further reason too, and that the Polish, Pol Polish government officials and others say they have absolute evidence that Russia is um, putting money into environmental groups right across Europe in order to lobby against uh, the development of shale gas right across Europe. Why? Because obviously it's competitive uh, with this quite expensive uh, Russian <coughs> gas. Okay. So that's the Russians. Uh, the Germans. The Germans are locked into long-term contracts with Gazprom. They've signed up for, I think, more than a decade at a fixed price. Uh, they have invested in a pipeline between Russia and Germany with Nordstrom and guaranteed its um, finances through the banks. So the Germans, so the Poles say, don't have much of an interest in seeing a competitor come from the East um, producing gas at a lower price. So the Germans are not too keen on very fast development of these sort of Poland's shale gas. The French, well, they want to sell nuclear power and nuclear technology to everyone, including to Poland. Um, also, the French, much of the shale that's in France happens to be in the finest wine areas. So the vineyards are not too keen on having um, gas um, drilling going on in the middle of the vineyards. So uh, the French are probably opposed to the development of Poland's shale gas. Then, of course, the Greens, which oppose um, almost everything. Um, I hope there are not many, too many greens in the audience, but as I went over the snowy mountains um, just last week, past the great snowy mountain scheme, I said to myself, well, th that would never have been built if the greens had had the influence that they have in government today. Um, and the greens are certainly opposed to uh, the development of shale gas. And then you have the European Union, um, which is very divided on this. And if we can go to the next slide, um, we found when we were there, they came out during the week we were in Warsaw, three reports from the European Union from three separate directorates Directorate for Energy, Directorate for Climate Change, and Directorate for Environment. These reports were produced with different teams, 
who really didn't talk to each other, with different um, policy groups advising them, and came up with sort of different recommendations. But the strongest one was the one that came from GG Environment. And this was extremely negative on the development of any shale gas across Europe. It was actually quite similar to the kind of reports which have come out um, in New South Wales about the development of shale in, in, in this state. And uh, there's a link there, which uh, if you want to look at it, you can read this 150-page um, report. It's quite interesting, but I can't give more, more details of it now. So, moving swiftly on, Warsaw <coughs> is determined to go ahead. So, I'm so we were told. Um, the legislation, the regulations are being drawn up by the public servants now. They say that in Poland, there's really no environmental opposition to this. We weren't able to test this. We didn't really, we went to Krakow, but we didn't really go to any rural areas. But that's what uh, people in Warsaw were telling us. And um, the government say the farmers support it because they see this as a way of creating more jobs and creating additional income. And um, another key point, the major, investor in all of this is the United States, not China. It's interesting, the foreign minister of Poland was in Beijing when we were in Warsaw, and although shale was on the agenda, there's no significant interest by the Chinese in Poland's gas, although they do have a direct interest through a Canadian company which they own, which um, through a secondary company uh, is investing in Poland. Finally, relations with the East. Well, the Poles are the leaders of an EU um, campaign to try and improve relations with the East. You will know that Ukraine supplied <coughs> by the European Union, along with a number of other countries um, in the East. However, this seems unlikely. So what the European Union is doing is trying to encourage better relations with the countries across its borders, like Moldova, Ukraine, um, Belarus, um, Turkey, and Russia itself. And the Poles are heading this group. And actually, they're managing to have a reasonable relationship with Russia, despite the misgivings that I've mentioned earlier. They actually have a rather bad relationship with Belarus. Uh, the diplomat who is responsible for dealing with this said she no longer went to Minsk. She found it inhospitable, unfriendly, just simply wouldn't go there. She would have meetings in Warsaw if they came to her. This was a direct quote from the diplomat in charge of Poland's relations with Belarus. They're not good. Relations with Lithuania are not that brilliant either. Um, I asked about um, asylum seekers and immigration. Now, it's interesting that apparently, and these are the official figures, only 57 asylum seekers came to Poland last year, despite the fact that Poland is a lot nearer Afghanistan, Iran, Iraq, and many of the other countries from which Australia derives its asylum seekers. And um, when, I asked, when we asked the question, we were told, oh, well, they don't come this way. They all go by Greece and Turkey. Well, that may well be the case. I've no means of checking that. Um, but the fact remains that um, Poland remains a remarkably cohesive um, society. Only 1% of um, the population of Poland um, are foreigners, even though um, 250,000 Ukrainians have come to Poland with work visas and many of them have stayed and many of them have moved on to other parts of Europe. Um, Poland, Poland is now finding people moving back to Poland, Poles that have left are coming back, but nonetheless the net migration over the last five years I think does amount to about two million and the Polish uh, association that deals with immigration told us that Poland could easily absorb 
another 400,000 people without any trouble. So, um, before we get to questions, my conclusion is that um, Poland's future is absolutely tied into the future of the EU in general and in particular. Um, it regards its old friend Britain as a bit of a lost cause, which is rather sad. The United States is seen as its main protector, but um, I always worry about that because they're not sure whether this is really something they can rely upon. They keep talking about the Afghanistan dividend having um, put Polish lives at risk and we had Poles die in Afghanistan as indeed Australia has done. Poland is expecting some return to this commitment and is not entirely sure that it's getting it. And um, there's little discussion, and this is really off the wall I suppose, but little discussion of the Asian century. I started talking to people and everywhere we met about the Asian century, which you hear a lot about here, nobody really heard about the Asian century, nor did they pay much attention to it. Nor did they necessarily believe it was the Asian century, which either shows um, that they may be a bit blind to what's going on in the world, or